let's stand and sing and worship God together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. Spoken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. In every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. In every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Open up the gates. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save, He to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. His robe power in fighting our battles in every knee will bow before him our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains in every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship You. Father, we worship you, you and you alone. We'll come before you in faith. We trust you. We entrust our lives to your hands. We ask that our words of praise honor you today and please you. Be with us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning from Kids Street as well. I think some of our kids are helping their parents with the youth or with the security. So, um, you know, I'll... I'm a school teacher, so we live our schedules from uh, one holiday to the next. So our holiday coming up is love and, um, you know, Valentine's Day and the end of January, moving into February. Uh, Pastor Kevin's talking about uh, Romans 13, a life of love. And it got me thinking about, you know, as a school teacher, I think about grammar. So... What is love? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Right? Is it just something that we feel, I love you? Right? We have a feeling. Um, you know, our family, I guess we got into the habit of just saying, I love you every time we were saying goodbye. Right? We get done talking to somebody on the phone. We say, love you, and then we hang up. Or when someone's leaving the house, before they you know, walk out the door, they'll turn around and say, love you, and we'll say, love you back, you know. Um, but one of my favorite songs is called uh, More Than Words, and it's by uh, Extreme. And it talks about, in the song, um, I don't want you to tell me that you love me. I would rather you treat me like you do. So then I would know that you would love me, right? Wow. On demand? That's pretty good there, Nate. <laughs> so, in Romans 13, it says, you know, hate wrong, hold tight to good, honor each other, work hard, serve the Lord, rejoice, be patient, 
bless, pray, practice hospitality. All verbs. And if we treat each other like that, we won't have to tell everybody that we love them because they will know. So if you'll bow with me, we'll worship the Lord that loves us just as much. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for your love. Please help us to take the love that we have from you, that we feel for each other, and help us to treat one another with love so they know that through you, you love us all, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's hear you sing out loud. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love with holy fear I want to take your word and shine it all around but first help me just to live it Lord and when I'm doing well help me to never seek a crown for my reward is giving glory to you. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my Savior God to thee sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul Thou art, thou art, 
understand you've taught us to share what we have so we pray to practice that help us to have generous hearts and spirits to give back some of what you've given so that others may be fed and clothed and hear of Jesus thank you father for loving us in Jesus name we pray amen Bibles with me this morning, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Continuing in our series, God told me, 
trying to figure out exactly what God has told us. So we read scripture. Again, the most reliable way to tell what God is telling you to do in your life. And we do believe that God speaks to people. He never tells them to do that which is against biblical teaching. We have to remember that. Apart from that, he may tell us to do all sorts of things. Romans chapter 12. For most of us, we read verses 1 and 2, very familiar passage, and we stop there. But this is a, a rich and very powerful passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 12. Today we're talking about how we are to choose a life of love. And all week long I've thought about how we talk about love. And Dave was talking about love is emotion and action and all those kinds of things. And there's tough love and soft love. And I, I see it all and so do you. I was thinking of one, one of the kids this week at child care. He was going up the steps and he was goofing off. And he was, he's four, you know, so he doesn't really know much about the world yet. And he hasn't understood and figured out that if you run with your hands in your pockets, that's a bad thing because you can't catch yourself. So he ran in and he was being all goofy and his mom was saying, stop Xander. And he didn't stop. And Xander was dancing up the steps with his hands deep in his pockets. And his feet slipped out from under him and the full weight of his body hit the nose on the steps. And, of course, his nose exploded in a pool of blood and bubbles. And his mom said, oh, Xander, get up, my gosh. And she was not very gracious and kind. And she looked at me and she goes, he does this all the time. So she loves him, though. There's no doubt about it. She picked him up, wiped his blood up and all this. But Xander screamed for a long time. To contrast, one week before, another little boy with his mama, was in a really good mood. And the steps are a hard thing when you're three and four years old. I, I didn't remember that when I was that age, but evidently steps are hard because this little bitty kid ran in. He was in a good mood. His mom was chasing him, and he ran up the steps, and he fell and banged his head and rolled all the way down the steps. And he just wailed like he was going to die. And his mama picked him up and said, Oh, baby, I love you. It's going to be fun. And just all that soft, gushy love like a grandma would. And he calmed right down. And I thought, there's a contrast of love. The first one, she loved her baby, but she's tired of his antics and she gave him some tough love and sometimes we need that. But the other one heard and was reaffirmed that mama still loved him and yes, his face was bloodied and he was going to be fine and mama still loved him. And so it wasn't just a few seconds. He sucked it up a little bit and he wiped the snot all off his face and he wanted down for mama and he ran up the steps and everything was good with the world. So the way we express our love sometimes makes a difference. So I, I wanted to tell that story just because different situations call for different kinds of love. And sometimes what looks like meanness isn't. Sometimes it's tough love. And I understand all that. But we're going to talk today about how we as Christian can follow God's word to us. Choose a life of love. As always we pray. I'll give you a few, moments to, a few moments to pray where you're seated and I'll close and we'll look at this passage together. Join me please as we pray. Father, we thank you today for your love for us. It is emotion and love and warm fuzzies and commitment and action and all those things. Thank you, Father, for demonstrating to us what love is. Thank you for your word which teaches us what love is and is not. Help us, Father, to listen to you, to choose a life of love and to express a love that lifts others up. We live in a world that needs much love. We hear the news. We hear of wars and rumors of wars, of hatred and killings and all those things. And it's obvious your simple teaching to choose a life of love is often ignored. We ask for mercy. Forgive us, Father, for resisting your word. We pray this morning you would teach us to live and love. Help us to be gracious and kind with others. We pray for those who have power over us. Give them wisdom and discernment and a sense of loving their people. We pray for those in Ukraine and other embattled places. We pray that love would overcome hate and peace would be experienced. We know that in this world, we contend with so much hate. 
help us. As always, we pray for our soldiers and first responders and their family. Protect them wherever they serve. Use them to bring peace and justice and to help people survive. Give them a spirit of love. Lord, we're a sinful people. Help us. Teach us from your word now, Lord. We know that you say, choose love. Help us to learn how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scriptures teach us that God is love. Maybe our video can help you to think a little bit of what we're talking about today. Debbie? The Bible. It's God's Word, right? But what's it really all about? All the stories, all the verses. Here's a thought. Did you know that there's a thread that runs throughout Scripture? A storyline that begins in the beginning and ends at the end. Here, I'll show you. You know in the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the world. And He saw that it was good. The sun, the moon, the animals. Then He made man and woman. He made them to live with him in the garden, but they sinned, and their sin created a separation between them and God. But God had a plan, a plan that was bigger than Adam and Eve. God had a plan to call a people for himself, and through these people, to bless all people. The Israelites were God's chosen people, but sin wasn't done messing things up. God's people turned from him. But like I said before, God had a plan all along. This is where Jesus comes in. The little baby boy born in a manger. The man doing the miracles and preaching and teaching. This man, this Jesus, would give his life on the cross as a once and for all payment for our sins. And this payment would forever break down the wall of sin and guilt that separates us from God. Jesus' sacrifice made right the relationship between God and humans. Scripture says one day he'll return to finally redeem all of his children, ushering in an eternal reign from heaven's throne. And from that day on, all nations will join in an eternal song of worship to God. Oh, and you know that thread we talked about? The thread that ties all this together. That thread is love. God's unfailing love for all humankind. A love big enough to seek the redemption and reconciliation of all people throughout all time. A love big enough for the whole world. A love big enough for you. It is a cool story, and it's all right here. So if you want to know more, go ahead, pick it up. The thread is waiting. There is that thread through Scripture of God loving us, of God acting in the very beginning to create us in His image. No one made Him do that. He made it so. We resisted. And in judgment, He spoke of His love. Punishment was severe, but there was hope because the God who had been Offended by man's sin, still loved us. And that is the Old Testament. And it's the New Testament too, isn't it? Man's sin, we resist God for whatever reasons. Sometimes we just ignore him, don't know about it. But often we resist. And God, the ultimate parent, loves us anyway. Even in judgment. Today we're going to be talking about God's love. And in Romans 12, there's this great passage. So follow along with me if you would. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9, talking about how to live a life of love. Beginning at verse 9 in Romans 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. 
not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul teaching good people how to love. Now, everybody knows how to love, or we think, but we often don't understand. We hear people, we hear stories of people, they love their spouse, but there is abuse in the home. And we think, that's not love. But that's what they've learned. We hear about people who say they love their country, they love the world, and yet the way they live shows that they have a lot of hatred within them towards their country or their world. They don't know how to love. Paul understood that. God understood. He said, Paul, and this is how I think it worked, he put within Paul's mind the understanding, these are good people, these are my people, I love them, but they do not understand how to love Teach them. We had to teach our little girls how to love each other. Our two girls were sweet little girls. They loved each other if they were in the mood. You know what I mean by that, right? If they weren't in the mood to love each other, they were cats all day long. Tammy finally bought a poster that taught them how to love each other. Why did God give you sister to love and take care of? That was her feeble attempt to break through the thick skulls of little girls on how to treat each other. It took them years to learn. Like I said, when they were in the mood to love, they knew, but they weren't always in the mood. They had to learn. That even when you're not in the mood, you don't have to be spiteful and vengeful and mean. They had to grow up. Not everybody does that. This is why we have adults living as they do. They don't understand what love is. So when we read this passage of Scripture, we see God teaching us, this is what I mean when I say, love one another. Oh, and by the way, in the New Testament, that phrase, love one another, which is a very particular grammatical construct, is given 15 times. 15 separate times, five different authors use that phrase, love one another. They kept repeating it over and over and over. Love one another. So on screen is his first idea. A godly faith will be a loving faith. This is in contrast to the faith that is often angry. I like watching YouTube videos. And if you're brave, you can type in anything you want and see a bunch of videos on that. So this week, in preparation for this sermon, I typed in the idea, uh, the, type in the phrase, mean preachers. And man, did I get an earful. There are thousands of videos of mean preachers. Preachers spewing hatred for white people, black people, gay people, straight people, Americans, non-Americans, Democrats, Republicans, blah, 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 blah. In the name of Jesus, puking out literal hate. We hate these people. We want them to burn in hell. They are going to hell. They can't be like us. We don't want you in our church over and over and over. Obviously, those preachers have ignored this passage. When we say, I love you, it's got to be different, doesn't it? I'm not the first one to punch in the phrase, mean preachers. I noticed that some of those videos had over a million views. Somebody's watching videos of mean preachers. Probably a lot of people. If I wanted to hate Jesus and hate church, I would watch those videos because they would make me hate Jesus, hate the church, and hate Christians. And indeed, many have. So somewhere along the way, when we say, I love you, we've lost that understanding of what it really means. 
Actually, when you say I love you, it's kind of a loaded thing. Think about it. Dave, you said in your home, you say I love you. I get it. We do too. And sometimes I live up to it. Sometimes I forget in anger or I'm not in the mood or whatever. I love you. It means when we're at our best, we say I love you means I am committed to you. I accept you. I will help you. I'm here for you. At its worst, I can say I love you if you earn it, if you're good enough. We never intend to do that, but it often comes out that way. So what we have to do is learn to say it in a way where when God says love one another, we actually do that in the spirit in which it was given. God says, I love you. And so God taught us how to live. That's what the essence of Scripture is. God teaching us not just what to believe, but how to live. Think about it. Don't beat your kids. He wants the best, not just for your children, but for you. Treat your spouse with respect. This is how you love. Avoid violence when, it, 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 when it's up to you. And those kinds of things, God teaching us how to love, how to live peaceably with others because he loves us. The New Testament is full of those things where we're taught that God loves us. This week, we had a funeral service for one of our own, Margaret. And the text I used was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son. That whoever lives and believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. Because he loves us, he has acted in history to save us. To give us a chance to be different. To help us to rise above our impulses and be better. And that really is the essence of the scripture. God loves us. And so, we are taught to be like God. Love one another. One time, Jesus was talking and his enemies were in the crowd and they were trying to trap him. Say, Jesus, which is the most important commandment in the Old Testament? And that was a big deal to Jewish people, the Ten Commandments. And it was a trap because Jesus knew that if he said one, somebody would gripe, say, well, what about the other nine? What about those? Jesus is pretty smart. You remember what he said. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's hard to argue with those. If you remember the Ten Commandments, the first five deal with your relationship with God. Don't use his name in vain. Don't forget the worship. Things like that. And Jesus said, love God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love for God takes care of those rules. The other five commandments were... For rules of relationships, don't lust, don't lie, don't kill, etc. So Jesus combined those and said, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Covers the rules, doesn't it? In some ways, Jesus took a really complicated rule book, which was Judaism, and made it really simple. You love God. And you love people. And thus you have fulfilled the whole law. See, Jesus was pretty crafty, but also he understood the essence of faith. The essence of faith is not to give you religious rules, to make you jump through hoops, to give, get God's stuff from God. You know, sometimes we think, well, the purpose of going to church is so God will give me stuff. And I want to give an offering so God will give me more back. In fact, I was taught that in college. I went to a preacher college. And we were taught that giving an offering, and this is how we were taught. When you teach about offerings, make sure people understand that it's an investment program. That if you give 10%, God will pay you back a hundredfold. And of course, that's not true. That's not what God intended. He just wanted you to give generously. And blessings do come back. We miss that idea, or my professors miss the idea, of loving God. God is love. His primary motivation towards us is love. And the idea of faith and how you are to live out your faith is to live a life of love. So what does God say to you? Live a life of love. Oh yeah, choose 
to live a life of love. I was talking to you earlier about the mamas, the study and contrast of the way they love their kids. For some people, love comes easily, and they give it easily. And there's warm fuzzies and tears and smoochy kisses and all those kinds of things. Other people are kind of cold, just the way it is. And they love in their own way. It's a little hard to see sometimes. And I, I can't argue with that. I grew up in a home where mom and dad were cold and they were distant. And, and so I learned not to be expressive of love. My wife grew up in a home where it was hugs and kisses and smooches all day long. And I didn't understand that. I thought it was the weirdest family I'd ever been around. And I married into it anyway. Turns out they understood something that I had not picked up. Now, I later learned that my mom and dad were the way they were for a lot of reasons. And that they did love me and they were sacrificial in their love. But it was hard to discern sometimes. But I learned it's better if you can be more expressive. I'm not always warm and fuzzy. I used to, I used to call people huggers. And that was an insult. Do you know what I mean when I say someone's a hugger? Dora, you're a hugger. Some of you guys are huggers. Some of you gals aren't. I get it. Used to be an insult. I used to call people huggers. And my wife knew that I did not want to be around huggers. And I realized that there was something wrong in the way I perceived that. I'm not always a hugger. I'm kind of careful. Because, you know, our culture is kind of weird on touching and hugging now. But I'm a hugger with my grandkids. And I want them to know that. I'm a hugger with my kids. I want them to know that. Because love is practical. Not only will a godly faith be a loving faith, the next point on screen is a loving faith will be an intentional and practical faith. In other words, if you practice this faith that says love one another, your love is based on God's love, your love is based on the love of God expressed in Jesus, your faith will be practical. And if you pick up on biblical teaching, and you hear that phrase 15 times over in the New Testament, love one another, you will begin to learn how to express that. Look at verse 9, if you would. The first phrase, let love be without hypocrisy. Well, you know, you know what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is when you say one thing and do another, right? So, when you love without hypocrisy, that means you love and people know it. You show it. And even when you're angry, your love is restrained. When you're happy, your love is expressed. When you can, in love, you share what you have with others. And, and you build people up. And you're known as someone who loves. And it's just one of those things. And, and for, like I said, for some of us, it comes easier than with others. Some people are naturally expressive, it seems. Others are more reserved and come across as cold. No right or wrong there. But what you have to learn to do to communicate this love of God is to express it in a way that people see it. Let love be without hypocrisy. Sometimes we have to say, I love you. And we have to be taught that. And sometimes we have to make ourselves say that. The crazy thing of that, because we don't have to be taught how to say, I am so mad at you. I have a three-year-old granddaughter, and she has nothing but mouth, was born with her mouth open, hasn't shut it since. And it is so easy for her to be angry and to express that anger. She's very effective. She's a redhead, what all that implies. And she's very effective at expressing her anger and disgust and so on and so forth. And she will have to learn to express love. It'll be a little harder for her. And it, she does it sometimes, but it doesn't come naturally. She will have to learn. And she will. She's got a good mom and daddy. It may be hard for a while. Some of us have to learn how to express love. So on screen are some ways that we can practice this love that is without hypocrisy. Love without hypocrisy, another way to say it is sincere love. Where you say, I love you or I love people. And people go, well, I believe it. If you say, I love you, and someone says, you're hiding it pretty well, it's not happening, guys. 
And sometimes we need to remember that. So we have to be careful how we act, how we talk, and those kinds of things. Measure your words. Think before you talk. Now there's a thought. Think before you act. So on screen, look at verses 9 and 21 if you would if with me. Love, let love with be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So one of the things God wants us to do is to resist evil. Not only in our own life, but in the lives of others. In, in, in the culture, in the greater sense of how is our culture going? How do people react and things like this? So if you love people and you say you love people, then what you have to do is be sensitive to you. Evil is anything that is apart from God. You can define it however you want. But it's those things that hurt people, that contradict this idea that you love people, fight it, stand against it. And when you see it in a greater culture, stand it and fight against it, stand against it and fight against it. And that means when you encounter someone who was doing something that hurts others, step up and say something. You don't have to be nasty about it. But you can say it like this, you know, there's a better way. And I've been in those situations and it's awkward and uncomfortable. And I've been in those situations where if you say something, you're ridiculed. I've done that too. I've been on both sides of that one, by, actually, by the way. And what we have to learn to do is resist evil. So for you, when you love people and you say you love God, that means resisting sin, doesn't it? Sin is evil. Sin is violating God's teachings. It means ignoring what God wants you to do. Acting on your feelings and emotions and things like that. Resist that. It's, it's that call for good. It's, it's the do's and don'ts things of the faith here. Love is expressed in a life lived without evil. Standing without evil. I have a grandson, Henry. He's a good kid, a sweet boy. He's a big one. I've told you about him. He's on his basketball team with this kid. And he's in a very conservative area. And this kid came in and he had a, a gay pride jacket on. The kid's six. Gay pride, his mom and, dad, mom, and mom are, are lesbians and they're that kind of thing. It's kind of an out and he's never seen that before. And my daughter was having this conversation because they said things and did things and the clothing made him ask mom, what's going on there? And so my daughter had this very difficult conversation. She avoided a lot of the things and said, listen, it doesn't really matter what they think or what kind of clothes he wears. Just treat him like a normal kid. Just be nice to him and he'll be fine. That's love without hypocrisy. The six-year-old doesn't care about the politics of the LGBTQ1 plus AA movement. And you don't either when you're dealing with people. Just resist evil. Be gracious and kind. The other one, build others up and share life's experiences. If you would look at verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Drop down to verse 14 and 15. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. So, build people up. When you see someone hurting, hurt with them. Whether or not you feel it or not is irrelevant. If they're hurting... Encourage them. Give them a hug. Pat them on the back. doesn't matter how you do it. When someone's hurting, build them up. I wrestled in high school and I wasn't really very good. And after one particularly gruesome match where I really got clobbered and destroyed, I was sitting there, I was moping pretty heavy because I, I looked really bad. I embarrassed myself and the world, I thought. And I was pretty blue. And my best friend who won his match came up and sat behind me and I was, I was grieving and feeling sorry for myself. And he grabbed my shoulder and this wasn't a loving thing. It was, it was a 12, uh, you know, 16 year old guy thing. Shook me and realized, ah, get over it, pain. You'll be fine. That's exactly what I needed. And he was right. I was fine. I was still a loser that day, but you know, but I was Okay. And I think of that often because, you know, I wasn't a hugger and he wasn't a hugger and all those kinds of things. But we were good friends, had been so since first grade. And I needed that. So give that to others. Give hugs if you're into that. 
If not, there's other ways you can communicate love. Just build people up. It is easy and easier to hurt people, and you know that. And I don't know what there is about us, but it's easier to insult than it is to build up. It's easier to shoot your mouth off than to choose your words carefully. It's easier to insult than to guide. Instead, choose to be a blessing to other people. Build them up. Look at verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. This is a big one. Treat people like they're equal, because they are. Creation story has this crazy idea that we are all created in the image of God. Male and female, absolutely equal in the eyes of God. That goes for people that don't agree with your politics, or your understandings of gender, or your understandings of world schemes and all those kinds of things. God creates us equal. It doesn't mean our ideas are equal. It doesn't mean that your ideas are no better than somebody else's ideas. People have wrong ideas. That's true. But somehow, recognize that they are human beings and your response is to love them and treat them with respect. You can say, I disagree. You do not have to roll over and let people bully you with their ideologies to love them. You don't do that with your kids. You don't do it with your moms and dads. I've had some, have some of the harshest arguments I ever had with my mom and dad. And I loved them anyway. And they loved me anyway in spite of me. So what we have to do, if we want to choose that life of love, is learn how to agree agreeably. Because that's how you want to be treated, isn't it? Remember Jesus had that golden rule thing. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's how you express love. Treat them with respect and courtesy. The pesky thing about this love thing is that the insults that feel so good to spew are almost never appropriate if you're trying to love others. That's tough. One other thing. Look at verse 9 if you would. 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Meaning, in your personal relationships, forgive. Try not to hold grudges. Again, God doesn't teach you to do stupid things. So that doesn't mean if someone lies to you that you keep going back for more. What it does mean is you give up that right to revenge. Well, he lied to me, why don't I get to hurt him? He whacked me, why can't I whack him back? And so on and so forth. You know the natural thing, natural thing to do. So you have to learn, God wants me to forgive and go on. Now, the dirty little secret about forgiveness is when you forgive, you are the beneficiary because that burden of hatred and anger and the need for revenge is taken away when you truly forgive. You see, that doesn't make sense. But for those of you who have learned to forgive and move on, you realized it. Anger and hurt are burdens and baggage. Man, we all carry it. We can carry it for decades. Or we can let it go and move on. This does not mean you can't seek justice in a legal way. You know, some people say, well, if you really forgive, you can't punish criminals. That is not what it's talking about. In personal relationships, when someone hurts you, let it go. Now, if they keep hurting you, protect yourself, move away. God isn't asking you to be anybody's doormat. But when someone does hurt you, let it go. Just move on. In doing those things, you're putting love into action. You can say to that one that's hurt you, if you want to, you know, I, I love you, so I'm just going to let it go. And they'll probably think you're a nut, and that's okay. Just move on, and you'll be the better for it. On screen is a passage of Scripture. Read this with me, if you would. But concerning love of the brethren, you have no need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For you were called to freedom, brethren, 
Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. So when God whispers in your ear, choose a life of love, this is what it's talking about. Just be gracious and kind to people. Let things go and don't carry that anger of, with, with you through your life, even if they did hurt you. It is easy to carry grudges. That's natural. But this love of God thing can challenge you and help you to get past that. And you will be better. And you will be happier for it. Nate's going to come and lead us in a closing hymn of invitation. This is an invitation to love God and respond in love. Maybe by responding in faith and saying, I want to follow Jesus. Other ways to say it are to respond and say, I'm going to make a choice to be nicer to you fill in the blank. I'm going to try to get my mouth under control. I'm going to keep my temper under control. So on and forth. You understand the situation, don't you? Why don't you stand with me? Say yes to God's call. If you want to make something public, you can. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Pray with me, please. Father, again, we thank You for Your presence and for Your love for us. Help us. Help us to love others, to make that choice and not just once, but in every situation. Help us to honor you and to receive the love you've given us every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next week.